Okay. Hello, hello. Can everyone hear me all right? Yes. Yes, we can hear yes. you. Yes. All right. Excellent. Um, I seem to be having some minor audio issues on my side, but no worries about any of that. Um, welcome, everybody, to the next EMMS, or Envision Money Making Sense. This is a monthly webinar that we try to do at the last Thursday or third Thursday of every month, depending on how things work out. Obviously, Christmas is, and holidays are right around the corner. So we uh, we had this one a little bit early, on December 14th. Um, but don't worry if you weren't able to attend or if you wanted to pass this on to somebody. All of these webinars are recorded for everybody's convenience. Uh, you can register ahead of time. You can also still view the recording post, even if you didn't register. There'll be follow-up social posts that you can send to people or, or use at your own discretion. Uh, so as per usual, we have our wonderful uh, James Brewer with us today, founder and CEO of Envision Wealth Planning. And we're going to be talking about estate planning. Uh, saving you money and stress on your family. So uh, without further ado, James, uh, please take it away. Um, well, I assume that most of you know that I'm a certified financial planner and a uh, author, financial contributor to Forbes. So um, I'll dismiss with any more about me. Uh, but when you also work in the investing field, you always have to have disclosures. So fortunately, you can stop the screen and read the whole thing at any time you want to. Uh, but today, I have two of my favorite people, uh, Max Elliott and Ted Kester. Uh, we've worked together in the past um, with clients. Um, Ted and I have done a presentation or two. Uh, back when more often you would actually go to a place and make a presentation. Um, so now we don't really do that as much when we do webinars. Um, and uh, each one of them, um, I think, are great. Um, and otherwise, I wouldn't have recommended them uh, to my clients and work with the clients that um, we mutually have. Um, so I'll give you an opportunity to kind of Google, LinkedIn them and learn more uh, as you would like to be on um, what's on the screen here, because we have a lot that we want to talk about. So I'm going to just try to get us through this. So at Envision, we have this financial needs pyramid um, and we kind of blew it up a little bit to make it easier. Um, and you see the brown. So the brown is protection, but in protection, we think of things like, well, are your estate planning kind of basic documents in order? Uh, do you have disability income protection? Do you have life insurance? Uh, so those are the things that are the number one. And you see that, you know, it kind of progresses into cash flow, retirement, and accumulation planning, what we would refer to wealth building, and, you know, a more classical definition, let's say, of wealth transfer. And, you know, what's really interesting is uh, this is just a, what we call a stencil or a template from someone who's potentially, you know, more in the starting out um, arena of things, as opposed to, you know, more uh, investable assets and more complexity with lots of children and maybe grandchildren. And sometimes those people are like, well, why would I need to think about any estate planning? Um, you know, but even though we were talking earlier that you know, less than about 20% of the people actually have done any kind of financial or, or I should say estate planning and whether or not that estate planning was done properly or, um, you know, through a Google search or you jumped on some kind of site, we don't know, in fact, if you've got actually everything covered. So it, more the classical definition going to that number five, this really isn't like a menu of Happy Meal, but um, you know, on wealth transfer, we think of charitable planning and foundations and maybe tax planning, and maybe you've heard of those terms, have no idea what it actually means, but there is something that is a bit more common. Um, and we have something here that we call the structural assessment. 
It's actually 26 questions. We're only showing you the few related to today. So one of our big questions um, that we ask people is, have you reviewed your decisions in the past three years? In the past three years. Um, one of the clients that uh, one of the attorneys, I want to give it all up, um, it, like we did a plan five years ago, and I can tell you that with one of our mutual clients, and they've had a lot, a lot of life changes in the last three years. So I pick on the three-year period, and who knows, maybe the beneficiary you intended has moved on, or maybe they're not in favor with you. Um, lots of things. So we, we make sure that when we start the process with working with clients, we ask these questions. And we're going to delve into them a bit more um, right now. So why don't we start with you, Max? And you can give us your thoughts on um, what does estate planning mean slash encompass, and then we'll kind of go deeper in some of the topics as we progress. Well, thank you so much, James. And first, thank you for inviting me to uh, uh, collaborate with you and Ted on this webinar. Um, so estate planning, what does estate planning mean? It means the transfer, basically the transfer of assets upon death or incapacity, right? Severe or permanent incapacity. Assets are basically anything that you own. It could be a house, it could be your bicycle, it could be, you know, your pet, quite frankly. Um, we mm -hmm. don't like to think of our fur babies as something that we pass on, but generally we do have to provide care for the fur babies. So estate planning is that process by which assets are transferred to who you want, and you also determine when you want to transfer those assets. Um, what does it encompass? It encompasses determining and deciding who you want to receive your assets. So what do you want them to receive? Do you want uh, someone to receive the house and someone to receive, let's see, your jazz collection? Or uh, what about your fur baby, uh, you know, your dog, your cat, parakeet? Um, and so it, it involves determining who is going to get those, uh, those items. Then it also involves thinking about and determining who is going to be responsible for seeing that your intentions are actually carried through. So that would be what Ted and I refer to and you as well as a fiduciary, right? Somebody who has the legal authority to act on your behalf either during incapacity or upon death. And so your estate plan provides who that person is. And as long as it is validly executed, it provides them with the legal authority to act on your behalf. Estate planning involves a lot of just thinking and all of my content all of them, most of them, we have to go through some of those hard conversations because sometimes um, there are two children, sometimes there are no children, sometimes there are limited uh, chosen family members. And so it's a small pool to select from with respect to giving a person or those persons that very serious and sometimes like enormous responsibility. Um, trust sometimes are administered within two or three years and sometimes they're uh, administered in perpetuity. So, or, you know, for a long, long time. So we have to think, we have to help clients think through that. Um, they may not want to alienate somebody, but they recognize like a child's um, child doesn't have the acumen for actually distributing assets or taking care of their estate. So those are some of the hard conversations that we have. So in, um, estate planning involves really encompassing a lot of discussion, a lot of thinking, and then memorializing those intentions, those discussions, and that thinking in a legal framework that will be recognized by doctors 
uh, by financial institutions and also by the courts. Ted, do you have something you'd like to add to that? Well, first, I want to thank you as well uh, for inviting me and um, and having this opportunity to collaborate with uh, with Max and you. I'm I'm privileged, and I want to thank you that um, Max did a very good job of, of summarizing it. I don't really need to add more, except that I will say you set this up well, and and you have a a good process of how you um, go through a checklist or a list with clients. Because, you know, as Max kind of said, this estate planning is really just, a, it's an organizational process. I mean, you really are, as Max was saying, there's a lot to it, but, you know, you have to be thoughtful and it is, uh, you know, you're trying to organize those thoughts, intentions, and desires and, um, and having those discussions so that you can come uh, prepare and, and implement a, a, a well thought out plan. So um, I'm going to start off with you on the next one. Um, Max said a few times this this concept of incapacity. Mm -hmm. So I'm just going to give a little story that uh, of what I shared with the both of you. Um, so my mom is 95. So we assume that my mom is closer to meeting her maker uh, than her son is. But unfortunately, two Saturdays ago, I was uh, attacked uh, in a, during a botched carjacking and had several injuries that I'm still healing from and glad that I wasn't incapacitated that day. Uh, but suddenly that could have happened to me. And it wasn't the oldest among us. It was, well, I'm not the youngest among us, but but a lot younger than my than my mom. So kind of thinking about that a bit, um, you know, the question is, well, what happens if I can't uh, take care of my affairs or what about my health care? Ted. Um, well, it, 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 I think it is said in this country that there's probably uh, between around a quarter or a third of uh, the of the adults in this country that don't have their own estate. They haven't done estate planning on their own. So this is a good question to ask because um, it is applicable to most people. Um, well, if you, it's it's sort of uh, a bit in, imprecise, I guess, to say you don't have an estate plan because we all do. We all, you know, our, our great elected officials have already come up with an estate plan for all of us, whether we know about it or like it or not, it's there. Um, and, and probate and, and several other laws um, set these default rules. So in, to answer this question, if you if you don't take care of your financial affairs, there's there, there are laws that have these defaults and those defaults will determine who's going to be in charge of your finances, who's going to be in charge of your health care and who's going to get what and when. Um, and if you don't like those rules, then you have the freedom to do your own estate plan. Um, but in this situation, there, you know, there are a hierarchy or a priority list. And, um, you know, if you're a married individual, your your spouse is, is kind of has first priority to take care of your finances and to, you know, to take care of manage your health care. Um, and if, um, if, he or she is not available, then it's your children next in line. If you have children, um, they have an equal priority. It's not a birthright or a birth order uh, the way it's done. So your your children kind of have to come up with a plan um, of who's going to be in charge of what, or if they're going to make joint decisions. The thing I tell clients in this though is, and, and, and this was, and I'm being honest, when I came out of law school many years ago, and I was practicing as an attorney doing this work, I was very surprised that it's not sort of automatic that I thought, you know, if if my parents, something happened to them and they didn't have a health care power attorney or something that, you know, the other one would just be able to do what needs to be done. But that's not the case. Um, if 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 I would become disabled 
and I have no plans in place and I'm stuck with the default one that um, our legislature and governor have decided upon, my spouse has to go to court to be legally appointed. She does not have the right to go you know, to the bank and, and access my bank accounts without a, a piece of paper issued from the court that says she has the right to do that. Even she can bring our marriage certificate, you know, all the forms of identification that show that she really is my wife, but without that court paper, she'll get nowhere. And, um, you know, it, it's just, it, it, it's, it, like I said, that was surprising to me. And I think that is surprising to most people because it doesn't seem like what the rule would be, but there's a reason for it. it you know, you don't want people to, uh, to, to not be financially responsible because this is other people's money that they're dealing with. So um, if you're not married, to get back to your question, it, obviously you don't have a spouse that would, by the default rules, would be able to step in. It is your children if you have children. Again, they each have an equal right to, to, to make these decisions. Um, and then um, if you have no children, then you, you, you kind of go to next of kin, you know, parents if they're around or maybe it's siblings and so on and so forth. That's a really, that's a really good point, Ted. And I really, I want to touch on um, uh, what you refer to as a birthright, because it's really interesting how many people I have spoken with, and I'm sure you have as well, who just think that because they're the only child of their parent, that they're just going to inherit everything without any kind of plan or any kind of um, memorialization of their intents that's legally valid. And you and I both know that's not the case. Children mm -hmm. don't have a birthright. They have a right via the default rules, like you said, but they don't necessarily have a birthright. So it's really important, I think, for everybody to understand, even parents, to understand that if you want to create a plan that actually articulates your intentions, regardless of your children, you may have a godchild who you're closer to, that that's really, that's, that you should um, have an estate plan. And another thing that you mentioned with respect to health care, I've had a number of cases where unfortunately there was no power of attorney in place and there were distant cousins in distant states. And unfortunately the default plan that you talk about leaves those decisions to doctors. So it's critical, I think, that um, individuals take care of creating an estate plan for both while you're alive and while you're, you know, upon your passing. Uh, I might state that um, both of these attorneys uh, are in Illinois, and I believe we're talking of the default in Illinois. Um, I have clients across the country. So um, your rules may be different than the state of Illinois. Um, so just know that that's kind of the focus of what we're talking about here today. Um, so... That kind of sets up for me, Max, um, this this next question as well, um, regarding issues with beneficiary designations. So just stories from my life. I know of one person who I met and she had started her 401k at a company prior, like years before she got married, but now she had children. Well, she knew that her sister was the uh, beneficiary of that 401k. Um, if I'm wrong, attorneys, please correct me. Um, typically, if you are married at the time you open up a 401k, the default is it will be your spouse. Um, and it's not that you had some other choice, but if you pre you know, but if you had started prior, there, were, there was no need to for sure change um, that designation. That's one issue then um, that, that I'm aware of. I'll just throw out another one. So then, you know, you've got thoughts around potentially life insurance. You've got thoughts around retirement, especially I, we have several clients that are in their 30s that a parent passed on, quote unquote, prematurely, 
and now um, there's some significant in, inheritance um, of whatever that is, um, known as an inherited IRA. Um, and one doesn't know for sure if the intention of that past parent, um, or if you don't have any children, what the intention should be. So I just thought I'd set up this question with a couple of real world issues um, that I have, have had to deal with. So uh, we'll start with Max again. Thank you. So yes, um, people, the first thing that we tell clients is that beneficiary designations are very important, but as attorneys, we cannot actually take that paper or go online and change your beneficiary designations because that your 401k, IRA, what have you, those are contracts between you and that particular financial institution. But we also ask, after we finished uh, signing everything, executing everything, I want to see your beneficiary designations because we need to change that language just to make sure that it matches your intentions with respect to your plan. Um, I the war stories and horror stories that I could tell could go on for eons, but I will take like one, uh, for example, James, you mentioned life insurance. So if you are a single parent and you have a minor child, you really want your child to receive everything upon your passing, but you shouldn't name that child as the beneficiary of a life insurance product or even a retirement instrument, right? You, a minor child cannot, does not have the capacity to contract. So if you name your minor child as a beneficiary on any of those um, instruments, then you're going to be looking at, or your, your loved ones are going to be looking at guardianship, which is what um, Ted, uh, uh, he implied in his previous comments. So it's it's really important. I think this is where trusts come in and also wills to designate guardians. Um, this is where it's really important to get those beneficiary designations correct. I had a client, that's exactly what happened. Unfortunately, the mother of their child passed away and the child was named as designated beneficiary. And that client did not understand, now you have to go to guardianship court to get that paper to allow you to act uh, on behalf of your child legally. Um, James, you also, I know you know about the SECURE Act that upended everything with respect to beneficiary designations, um, which was passed. So the SECURE Act was passed in 2020. It used to, you used to be able to leave a non-spousal beneficiary your inheritance and they could stretch it out through their lifetime. SECURE Act said, no, they have 10 years. Well, what if this is a minor, right? And you have, like you said, James, substantial retirement interests. Do you want your minor to have a half a million dollars over like 10 years of their life to just use, you know, at the eight, between 18 and 26 or something? I don't think so. So these are really, it's really important to have your beneficiary designations on retirement um, instruments, on life insurance, on any, even bank accounts to match your intentions. Had any additional thoughts? Um, yes, I, I mean, I, yeah, it's you. You raise a lot of the good points, Max, and I. I, I agree with everything you're saying. And 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 this is an area that is ripe with uh, traps for the unwary, as they might say. Um, it you know there are so many rules with the you know the retirement assets, and there's a lot of tax. If you don't if you don't do these things correctly. You can cause tax disasters for your family members, you know, the survivors of you with, you know, that you could, there is actually, you know, ways where you can cause them to have to pay more tax than they can have ca access to cash on some of these things. And that can leave a real burden if they have a hundred thousand dollar tax bill, but they only have access to $10,000 of your retirement account. 
that's not that's not a good position to put any loved one in. Um, and so I think I think this is an area where you really need to seek out professional help. Um, you know, not just an attorney. Uh, you know, but you know the financial advisors. You know, James, what you do because there there is just so many ways to mess these up, and you want it to be clear. I mean, this is where you know your you, this this is a, a lot of times it is one of the most significant assets that it, that an individual has. You know, people you know have their house. You know, or not everyone has a house, but a house is a pretty valuable asset. Their retirement accounts pretty valuable. Well, you know, someone works for 40, 50 years, they can save up a lot of money into a retirement account. I mean, it's not uncommon to have a blue collar person that has a million dollars after working for 50 years. You know, it's not that uncommon. And so, you know, it's just something that needs to be discussed. And you, in, in, what I tell clients is you need to be educated. My job, and, and it's the same for Max and for James, we're educators. And when you kind of break it down, that's really what we're trying to do for our clients is to help educate them on, on the complexity of these issues and, and so that they can make informed, intelligent decisions, um, you know, because they know what they want to do. They just might not know how to do it. You know, and another issue that I'd say from the financial side of things is, you know, more and more people are working for a number of uh, companies. So we had one client that had about nine different employers, nine. Um, so just imagine maybe I was married, maybe I was divorced, maybe, you know, who knows what was happening, um, uh, you know, and the beneficiary designations being potentially different on nine different accounts. I believe that consolidation of these accounts is critical because the complexity of what you're dealing with is just multiplying with actually no real benefit to the multiplication. And now, you know, how are you keeping up with making sure that your intentions are actually maintained in the time that it requires to go and update nine different ones instead of just updating one? You know, so so and and, and one of the, the the challenges, and by the way, it's we are over a year at this point trying to get all of their money consolidated. We're down to one account. So that was pretty good that we're down to one account, but it, but them, the paperwork just back and forth, filling it out to the different places and every uh, employer situation can be different. So it's so, that's to me like almost your first trap in your beneficiary designations that you do have so many at so many different places and just even getting the inventory so we can pass that on to Max and Ted to actually be able to help you. It's just easy if we could give them one for your retirement accounts and maybe one or two for your insurance account. So that's to me one of the things um, to also consider as you're trying to make sure that the beneficiary designations are, are indeed um, what you want. Um, another thing that that recently came up, we had a client um, that was going to try to do some more advanced planning. Um, and there's something where you can, you know, someone can waive um, their right to pass it on to another heir, which is, you know, often something that an attorney might write up in the in the document. Well, they later found out that the person that they were receiving the money from and they had quote unquote, had time, they thought it was all correct and it wasn't. So when the money finally transferred um, or the person passed, it's just that the person passed, it did not say what the family thought it was supposed to say. Um, so one of the things that I'm starting to institute with, with our clients is just going through and, and reaching out to whatever companies that are your own accounts, or if you know that there's somebody that you're in the line of receipt of something that you have them go and make sure that what you expect 
it to say it actually says um i was joking with max and ted earlier at saying you know unfortunately no matter what the name brand of the company typically the people making sure that the beneficiary designation names are correct or the way that um, they may be titled if you would go to Max and Ted because they may have it going to a trust. That's they don't typically have like the the highest paid people working in those uh, in those positions. So um, you know what Max and Ted would know is critical information that was going to correctly allow it to go to your trust. It may not say it properly. So unless you go and say now that you know please send me receipt of that to make sure that it actually says what i intended for it to say so don't just trust the outgoing you know as one person once said trust but verify yeah no it's that's that sage advice james and, and max you said it too i i have all my clients <clears throat> send me copies of the accepted beneficiary designations on the company's letterhead or form that, so that I know that it's been processed and then I can review it to make sure it is correct. Cause then you've got a piece of paper that if it got lost or somehow, you know, it's not, you know, when, when you need that piece of paper, you know, after the client has passed away, you've got it because yeah, that, you know, Max says there's, there's, there's tons of war stories we could sit here and talk about for days where people thought it was correct, but no one checked. And then after mom or dad died or whoever is, the, you know, the participant in the plan is dead, you can't change it then. It's locked in stone and you have to deal with what it is. And if it's not what everyone thought it was, it can be problematic. All right, let me advance. We've talked about children a couple of times. Um, why don't we go a little deeper this time? Um, so, you know, just stories of people who either pass away or, you know, often there's some kind of unsettled situation between uh, parents of a child. Maybe they were never married. Maybe they were. Maybe they're in some process of, you know, uh, separation or divorce. Um, I'll let you make it as complex as you want to. But, you know, at the end of the day, people always want to say, but I want the child cared for. Um, and uh, Max and I had a situation where somebody had a plan, but the plan wasn't written down and the plan wasn't going to be very legal according to the rules of the state of Illinois, <laughs> but they had an idea. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, things can get complicated when um, you have, uh, you know, unmarried parents, but they chose to not be married. They may have had a child in vitro. There's all kinds of things going on. And then, you know, the laws of the state weren't intended necessarily or haven't been updated to consider these kinds of situations. So um, just with a little setup, um, Max, I think it's your turn. I'm trying to keep it straight, Ted. I'm not trying to, <laughs> you know, trying to keep it's, it straight. So, so James, yeah, there are, you touched on a number of complexities. And so there are so many stories going through my brain right now. Um, so you can start with, yeah, uh, a single parent who may be alienated from their family. So who, what happens to their child? Will they need to designate, you know, a guardian? And if they, you know, and it's really important to designate somebody because I've had this um, experience with clients, designate someone who shares their values, right? Because it's really important to you. You have you have certain values, whatever they are, you want to instill these values in your children. And if you don't create a plan that takes those values into consideration, your children may be unfortunately raised outside of that value system, mm -hmm. which you know would be really tragic. Um, if we just go to a married couple, let's talk about married couples. Um, a lot of married couples want to also designate 
married couples as co-guardians for their children, right? So then the, the question, and I know Ted is probably, um, there's a thought balloon. I see your thought balloon, Ted. It says, well, what <laughs> happens if these children, if, if the couple gets divorced, right? So, so we have to take those into consideration. So, okay, so you have this great couple that you want to act as co-guardians for your children. Well, sorry to ask this, but what will happen if that couple separates or divorces and they're not related to you? Who do you want to uh, take care of your children? You know, so that's really important. Um, another, I, I deal with multinational families a lot. And so, you know, they live here in Illinois, United States, but all of their family, all of their really close family is overseas, UK, Germany, wherever. So they want to designate those individuals as guardians, right? And we know that as a guardian, you have to at least be a resident of the United States or else that person that you designated uh, as guardian upon your passing, taking that child across seas will have uh, will have um, been could be convicted of international kidnapping. And so we don't we don't want that, right? So it's really important to um, make sure that you cover all of the bases with respect to who you want to act as uh, guardians for your children and not only who you want to, but can they? How do you resolve, how do you reconcile that like multinational issue or that um, maybe uh, value system issue so you know that's like like ted said we're educators we're problem solvers we think a lot we know the laws and that's that's what we're here to do yeah very well said max and, and you're right um on, on all those comments you know one i guess a few things i would add is you know this is a very important issue for my class, most people. I mean, you know, your children, you know, you know, if anyone who is a parent, you, typically that that is, you know, some of the most important people on this planet uh, that you have. Um, it is good to be thoughtful on this. And I tell, you know, clients, you know, especially if they have any sort of special needs ch children, you know, you got to give it some extra thought. Um, and, um, but, you know, I tell, you know, no, doesn't matter really how much money you have or wealth you have. You you need to have this discussion when you before you even become parents. I think you know you got that nine month period to be thinking about this stuff. Um, and I tell you know I've got several clients that you know newly married you know and and shortly you know thereafter they're you know they're having children. Think about this because again we go back to the default rules. There are default rules on who if you don't pick the court, a, a judge that, that, you know, they're all very smart people, but they don't know you or your kids. Most likely they don't know your kids at all. And so they've got to try to pick somebody that's right for your kids where save them the trouble, do it yourself. You know, your kids, you know, your family, you know, what's, you know, who most likely, I mean, there are some situations like Max said, where it can be difficult to find somebody that you can really trust, but you know, you think about it enough, you will find somebody and you need to pick them because in the situation Max said, where you, you know, they don't have really, you know, close family members, you know, maybe they have a really best friend next door neighbor or whatever, a coworker that they trust immensely and they know their children, but the default rules, you know, the next door neighbor are, is not, is not one of the default rules, you know, designated people, you know, it's not, it's not, it's, you just need to be thoughtful about these things. And, um, you know, so so two things that I would add, uh, and one goes to Max's point about what happens if that couple divorces. Um, so even kind of before that, our reason for talking about the, you know, have you reviewed things every three years? Well, maybe that couple got divorced and you had the ability to then make, to address the change before your incapacity occurred um, that now you had already appointed, you know, or, or fixed that situation. So, you know, we do know that life is fluid. That's why, you know, this isn't a set it and forget it. You know, you got to come back to it. 
sometimes you know in the year, you know, so don't wait three years. Our three years is just kind of a, you know, jog your memory what's happened in the last three years. Um, the other thing that I would also add um, that, you know, it, specifically here is you want the people to care for them, but are you providing some funds for them to care for the child? Uh, the safest one would be like there's some life insurance that's going to go somewhere that is at least, you know, an immediate fund because you don't know, you know, what the values of your other accounts may be, but um, there is a way to at least provide some some cash. Um, so, so that's one way um, you might, you know, think, you know, work with an attorney to think how should that be titled um, that gives you some flexibility to make changes to um, who the beneficiary is. Um, in, in certain cases, um, uh, there's another advanced technique, but I'm just talking about this one that just says, okay, I have funds available. I have funds available. Um, and now, you know, maybe at, at when the child's 18, 26, whatever the age for you, that you no longer would, you know, necessarily want to keep that, that specific dollar amount for, but, you know, I think it's just challenging to say, please take care of my child and you provide no uh, uh, income or, or assets for them from which to take care of your child, which if you believe in things like private school, now you're putting a burden on them that you know might be beyond their, their means. So um, we may wanna combine these two questions um, because I think they may spill yes. over. So just state them out. What happens if you don't have an estate plan slash what is the difference between a will um, and a trust? So I think it's Ted's turn to start. Yeah. Well, uh, thank you. Uh, yes, it, you know, we've covered, we touched on this a little bit earlier. Um, if, you know, if you don't take the initiative and, 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 and make your own will, uh, and, you know, and, and, and sign your own powers of attorney and a trust if necessary, you're under the default rules that the state of Illinois or your state that you live in have already set up for you. Um, you know, those, like we said before, th there's rules that say, you know, who's going to be in charge of your estate and your assets and your health care when you can't make those decisions and who's going to get what and what, you know, and what shares or what portions and when they're going to get it. Those, you know, those, there are all these default fault rules that are out there. Um, and they sort of are a one size fits all because that's, you know, that's the way the, the state legislators, they, you know, they, they can't try to provide for every unique situation. That's why they give you the, the option to make your own plan. And, um, you know, so, so if you, as far as the difference between a, a, a will and a trust, um, the, the main differences are, is that, you know, a, a, a will, when you die it is required by law, uh, and this is in Illinois, and I'm fairly certain it's, I think it's in every state in, in the United States, but it is required to be filed with court. You know, the, in the local court where you were a resident, your will has to go on file and it becomes a public record. So anybody that wants to go into the courthouse can, you know, can check out your will and look at it, take pictures of it, do whatever they want. Um, it's not a private document where a trust is, you know, really the only people that have a right to see the trust are the are the beneficiaries and the person you put in charge, the trustee. Um, you know, that's that's a that's a big difference. Another uh, difference between the two is a will does not have any effect until you are pronounced deceased. Um, it is, you know, that's just the way they've been set up for the thousand years or whatever it is that wills have been around. It is, it has no effect until you are deceased, where a trust becomes effective as soon as you sign it and you hand an asset over to the trustee to hold uh, for the beneficiaries. And so that's, uh, that is why trusts are known as probate avoidance documents because they can be created while you are alive and they can own the assets and 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 yeah you know, control how the assets get distributed after your death um uh you know, that's you know a lot of people say 
or I, I tell people what, uh, you know, probate and people want to say, oh, probate, you should avoid probate. If for the most part, you probably do. It, probate isn't, it, it gets, I guess, uh, a worse rap than it probably really deserves. Um, I tell people, you know, probate's been around for a thousand years. So it must do something right or we would have gotten rid of it a long time ago. The biggest problem with probate is that it's expensive, um, you know, especially, you know, in an urban area like Chicago, you know, it, you got court fees and, and, and attorney's fees. It can it can get fairly expensive um, and it's public. It is a public record. So, you, you know, if you have privacy concerns, uh, you know, they kind of go out the window if you have to go through probate because it has a, it's a public process um, and a trust is, you know, it's it's a way to avoid it because what probate in a very general sense, what it really is, is simply a retitling of a dead person's assets. You know, that's it, really what, you know, that's why it was created a thousand years ago is because you needed somebody to be able to plow the land after dad or mom died. And so they came up with these rules, you know, but a trust, you know, you can avoid probate because you don't own the asset when you die. Your trust does. And your trust, you know, is in existence as soon as you create it and it can live forever. Um, so I'll let Max, you know, you can, you know, chime in um, to add Thank your you. comments. Thank you. Thank you, Ted. No, you, you hit on a lot of the points um, that I think are really important, especially there was a question about the cost of estate planning. And to me, it's how much do you want to pay to avoid probate if you if your family, if you know your family, there are factions in your family, perhaps. Um, how much do you want to pay to ensure that the process is more streamlined and that the assets can be distributed sooner than six months, which is Illinois' creditor claim period, and most most probate matters have to abide by that six months. Um, so it's really, it, it's kind of a, a cost-benefit analysis that one has to do. Um, probate in Illinois and in other jurisdictions like like New York, like California and Florida is very lengthy. And so be, the longer it goes on, of course, the longer your estate has to um, deal with attorney's fees and so forth. So I think it's really, I think you're right that a trust is actually, um, a trust is actually important in terms of, in terms of avoiding those costs, those lengthy costs and that lengthy time with respect to probate. Um, another difference uh, between a will and a trust, um, and Ted, talk, Ted talked about it, uh, touched on it um, a little while ago, is that a trust is kind of hybrid. It's, it deals with state law or common law, but it also deals with the federal government law, i.e. the IRS. So there are tax provisions such as a marital deduction trust that allows a spouse, a surviving spouse, to inherit from their deceased spouse uh, relatively tax-free. And so a trust is kind of a hybrid in that regard. Now you can have those provisions in a will, but it's really difficult. And it, if you put provisions like that in a will, it becomes what we call a testamentary trust. And then you're looking at probate all over again. So those are a couple of things that I I thought of while um, you were talking, Ted. Thank you. Good, good, good points. Thank you, Max. And I thought this was a great setup for what is an estate planning and attorney and how they can help. I've already heard some things, but let me uh, let you both because um, we're coming up kind of on time. So um, we want to give a little time to closing and Q and A. So. Um, if you could kind of be a little brief on this one. Ted, why don't you go first? I, all right. I, I will I will say, it, it, you know, an estate planning attorney is someone who's experienced in this area that has been advising clients on the plan, you know, drafting wills and trust and powers of attorney, and as well as going through, you know, helping clients through the probate process, the estate administration process, 
and I, I guess it's so they, they've got that experience and they are they are going to be able to ask you the questions that you won't ask yourself or you wouldn't know to ask. Again, it gets back to that educational aspect. They, you know, a good estate plan attorney is going to help you make more informed and educated uh, uh, decisions on these various issues that you need to make. So absolutely. Thank you, Ted. You're absolutely right. And so what um, Ted is also saying is that estate planning attorneys are not attorneys that create documents, okay? That's not what we do. We solve problems. We help you think through things, like Ted said, that you wouldn't normally think of because of our experience, because of our skill level, um, because of what we've seen in both the estate planning world and the probate and estate administration world. If all we did was provide documents, we would have become extinct as soon as legal Zoom hit the airwaves, right? <laughs> but that's not what we do. Um, we help you help guide you through some of the most important and nuanced issues with respect to your family, whether they are chosen, whether they are, you know, blood relatives um, or both. So that's what that's what we do. Um, and I'd even say that, um, you know, as I've teamed with them uh, in the past, um, that the collaboration of, of thought uh, regarding your situation um, and learning what options that you may have uh, to, to solve it, but not coming in with the mindset of, I need this document or I need that document. Instead, more of a narrative of, uh, here's who I am, here's what I'd like to see, let them embellish your narrative and then figure out you know, what, what avenue um, you should go into. Um, so that's been my great experience with um, working with both of them. Um, I'm going to come back to Q&A. It's a little bit out of the order just because I want to make sure that we covered something um, if we didn't get there. So we always try to add something uh, into the presentation. So it's not simply all about information, but as well as having you act. Um, so one of the things that you could do is reach out to us um, and simply ask us for this, the rest of the questions to the financial structural assessment, um, or you could decide that you want to go a bit deeper um, as well, uh, and then we can send you that document um, and or if you want, you know, the direct contact information uh, for uh, Ted and Max, but I would think you've been so excited with all that they've said, you probably Google them already and you don't even need us to provide that. Um, we also have a, a document that we can send you, just kind of a thought starter. Uh, what issues should I consider when creating my estate plan? If you already have one, we have one called updating the plan. So again, if you just simply email um, that OPS at Envision Wealth, um, then we can get the appropriate uh, information out to you um, because you know we just believe that a more educated client is a better advised client because then we know what the right advice to provide us. So um, do we have some Q and A? Uh, why don't you take that for us, uh, uh, Mr. Barrow? Yes. <laughs> um we do. We have quite a bit of Q&A, so we apologize if we're not able to get through everything, but we'll try our best. So the first one uh, reads, how much does estate planning usually cost? Um, I'll, I'll tell you, the way I work at this is I, for all my prospective clients, I tell them that I will do a, a one hour no fee um uh, meeting in my office. Uh, the only thing I ask beforehand is that they fill out what I have as an info sheet, just so I can be very and I can be prepared, and we can make the most out of that hour. I don't want to spend you know the first half of that hour or the first fifteen minutes, whatever, is gathering all their information so that I so we can talk intelligently about it. You know, it's sort of like you know their their names, their contact information, the names of their children. And, and kind of a snapshot of their of their assets, um, 
so and how they own them so that when we have this hour discussion i can be asking them these questions of you know you know of issues that i spot from looking at that info sheet and then i will say at the end of the meeting here here's what i would propose that you do and here's where i how i charge and give them an estimate or tell them what it might need because it is very unique not every family or every person has the same you know, same estate planning needs. So I think that's what works best for me. Um, ditto. <laughs> uh, and an hour free consultation um, that is framed by a preliminary intake form that gives us a snapshot of your family, of your assets, of um you know, any issues that you think that you may have. And to Ted's point, every every family is unique. Truly every family is unique. Some people need trust, some people don't. Some people need wills. On occasion, some people don't. So it's really, it's, it's really, um, it's really difficult to just say it's going to cost whatever you see online, right? Because every family is is different um but i think estate planning costs less stress than going through probate and having family members argue and have to come to court and so forth so no, that, that's that's a very good point max i've seen you know even a a simple no argument probate typically costs more than an estate plan that i prepare it mm -hmm. typically does yep yep same here Okay. Um, so the, the next question we have is, I have a single parent who has increasing dementia. They live in another state. How do I best get her affairs in order long distance? Hmm. So every state, I'm going to take this one, every state well, that is different to a certain extent, right? And so if you're thinking about somebody if a loved one is cognitively impaired, and I'm just speaking generally because I am not giving legal advice on this webinar, um, just speaking generally, if someone is cognitively impaired, that jurisdiction, the jurisdiction in which they reside, uh, those rules apply. And for our, our uh, it states here when there is someone who is cognitively impaired, meaning that they they don't have the capacity, uh, testamentary capacity, the capacity to sign their name, understand who they want to give what to and understand what they own, the, uh, their bounty, um, then, then we have to proceed with guardianship. Um, in Illinois, uh, you can be a guardian um, for somebody in another state, but that that state you'd also have to apply in that state. So it's it's really difficult when someone is now presenting with cognitive decline because nine times out of ten they don't have the requisite capacity to actually ask for help and to execute estate plans. Uh, and wouldn't this be a case where if they uh, had powers of attorney in place, then the uh, person who was, I'm forgetting the right term, who, who, who that the they, agent, um, the agent. Um, yeah. who, so that the agent could, you know, by a doctor's uh, uh, evaluation, say that now this springs in and now I can step in as opposed mm -hmm. to, you know, at this point, you know, the decline has already occurred. The process is going to be a bit more arduous. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's yeah. a very good point, James. Powers of, powers of attorney would avoid uh, a court process as long as they're validly executed and you can be in any jurisdiction in the United States. Well, see, this is the good part when I have two experts that if I say it wrong, then you can correct me, especially I didn't know I, I was forgetting the word agent. Um, I try not to uh, take us over time. Um, so we are uh, at about right at, at time. Um, there's a couple of other questions that 
um, we can reach out and try to get some quick answers to. Um, you know, those who attended will get a replay. Uh, those who registered uh, will get a replay as well. So for the remaining questions, um, uh, we'll get answers from the attorneys and um, add that to um, what we send out. And I'd like to thank our uh, our great attorneys, Max and, and Ted. Uh, again, it was great seeing both of you um, in a Zoom window this time. Um, you know, in person is always better, but you know, seeing you in a Zoom window. And um, I'm sure that there are some people that are really going to be thinking a bit harder. I wanted to try to get this done at the holidays where families are together um, and certain conversations just can be thrown out lightly. Um, and, you know, but it also also a season for uh, what is our New Year's resolution? So, you know, we can resolve that we want to get our affairs in order. Uh, thanks again to all of our attendees and uh, Max and Ted. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you so much, James. So thanks. nice working with you, Ted. Really appreciate it. Yeah, likewise. Thank you, Max and James. I really appreciated it too. It's a great opportunity. It's lots of fun. Yeah. All right. Talk to you all soon. Bye-bye. Okay.